you say the word God, what, what do people think about? And I think they, they think about a guy in a white robe and true love and, well, it's a loving God. I think a more accurate picture of God is, is a judge, right? He is the guy deciding what is morally correct and, and good and what is evil. And, and ultimately, uh, when he comes back, he'll come back with wrath. It won't be a happy time uh, to see God. Jesus Christ is going to return, and he can return at any moment. We always have to be ready. The rapture makes me have to focus, because I, I, may, I may meet my maker tomorrow. So they believe that uh, Jesus is coming back. We don't think that he's going to make it a second time. You know, there's going to be a last battle. Israel is going to be attacked from the north, from the west, from the east. You've got North Korea, you've got Iran. And Jesus said, Israel's going to experience this distress until the end, the end of history as we know it. Stinger missiles on the wings, big uh, machine gun up in the nose. You know, Laura's, Laura's company actually builds and constructs the, and designs the propulsion systems. Uh, the company I work for uh, actually does all the external parts to the engine. I work on software code for a jet engine. <laughs> we, we have certain parts on the engine that um, we want to track the life of so that we know when to replace those parts. So what my job is, is to take these very complicated mathematical algorithms and we pretty much code it into the software. When we first met, I was certainly coming at religion from an atheistic perspective. It took a lot for me to just become open-minded to, all right, let me consider the Bible. Okay, how do we prove through, through historical fact? How do we prove through geology? How do we prove through astronomy? How do we prove through physics and math that the Bible is true? It was a struggle for the two of us to go through that, but... A lot of tears were shed. <laughs> oh, I think a lot of emotion was because it, he, he was... Because of your engineering background, he questioned everything about 10 times each, and the, the patients level that I that I had to endure <laughs> but I'll, I'll, I'll be honest I, I learned a lot having to prove what I believe so the point is the precision of biblical prophecy it was fulfilled precisely in the first advent of Jesus Christ Jesus the Messiah came just after that time frame ended this is what Christ says no man shall come to the Father but through me that's it he's the only way I'm accepting him at his word. I'm taking him at his word. Equals 173,808 days. Now this is why we use 360 day years. If the Bible weren't true, I don't even think we'd be creating jet engines. So this whole period of time, 490 years, is related to the conclusion of God's plan for history. There are prophetic activities in the Bible that have now come true as, as history has passed. So given all of that background, there's no reason to think that what, what the Bible further predicts to be true, which is the second coming, the rapture, and Armageddon, uh, won't also ultimately come true. So God has a contract with Israel. He, he, he has chosen that land. Uh, and it's incredible to watch history you know, evolve around that land.
rapture, it comes from the Greek word herpazo, which means to snatch up or take up. And when Christ returns in the clouds, not all the way to planet Earth, that he will come and catch up or rapture uh, believers uh, to be with him. At that instant, by one sixty-fourth of a second, boom, just like that, everybody who's trusted in Christ as Savior, those dead and those alive will be caught up together to be with Him in the clouds. We have numerous members of Congress who are Christians, financial leaders, uh, presidents, people in all kinds of influential, significant positions of power and influence will be gone. Well, you got a hundred million people, if there's only 50 million, who have suddenly vanished from this earth, off of elevators, off of escalators, out of offices, or the desk next to somebody. and out of cars on freeways and crashes and out of airplanes. The world would be terrorized. Where did they go? Who took them? Why didn't they take me? Are they coming back for me? may not even come back next year. You don't keep it water, but you can't hardly water a pasture. The rapture, in my view, will happen very, very, very soon. And uh, do I believe that I will hold a grandchild? No. No, uh, I, I don't, I just don't think we have that much time left. One on one, one on one, one on one. Oh, no. That was a trap. <laughs> Things are happening around the world that lead me to believe that the end times are close. Yeah, I mean, I keep up with things going on and, and I have a general idea of of what can happen, and, and the, the things going on in the Middle East is a good example of that. Everything has to do with Israel. Israel is kind of God's timepiece, his clock. But I don't believe that Travis will graduate. I do not believe that, you know, John will ever reach an age to drive a car. The girls, um... I have much comfort in the fact that the rapture is soon. We watch AIDS decimate so much of society, and we, we look at the poverty that's in the rest of the world. The wars that are going on, and 4,000 abortions a day. Today, Christians are becoming increasingly vulnerable to a worldview that certainly resulted in the persecution of the Jews under the Nazis. And whether you had uh, Nazis celebrating the Aryan race and, uh, and denigrating the Jew, uh, today you have multiculturalists celebrating uh, the feminist and uh, the gay lifestyle and denigrating the white European male. Evil people will come after this country, and there's a possibility that, that uh, uh, K, not a possibility, a definite certainty that chaos is going to rule. Mass killing, possibly millions of people. Just look at your life. 
Everything is backward. They call darkness light and light darkness. Abomination is overflowing, just as it was in Sodom and Gomorrah. I think the younger you are, the less inclined you want to believe the prophecy, or that end times is, is close, uh, that the rapture is close, for a lot of reasons. One, you've got your life ahead of you, and, and you don't want to let go of that. And uh, I think that's what makes it really difficult for, for young people. Everything has been fulfilled that needs to be fulfilled. There is not one prophecy left that has to be fulfilled before the church will be raptured. It is for our time. I mean, it could happen, but... It will happen. There's no could to but it. She's not saying it won't happen. She's saying it could happen in six months. It could happen in 20 I mean, years. it will no. happen. I'll retract that. It will happen. But it just may not happen But when is before it my happen? birthday. I know. I'm ready. So if he comes right now, I'm good to go. That's pretty much the way I stand. <laughs> But I just want to make clear, I believe in the rapture, and I look forward to, I mean, I always wanted to be part of it, but I wanted to be, like, 85. <laughs> it scares me. Like Christy feels, I kind of wish that I knew that I had time. I really want to get married and I want to have kids and raise a family and work and do all that. I mean, I'd like to see the world, but it doesn't seem fair. I mean, you know, your grandparents have lived these long lives, have all these stories to tell you, and they've kind of adjusted to the fact that, you know, they're not going to live terribly much longer. And so you've grown up hearing all these stories and you want your own stories and you want to live these experiences yourself. And if you have, you know, you're done at 24, then there's only so many experiences you get to have. Our college uh, only allows Christians to come here. I want to teach them to live a biblical worldview, to see the world as God sees it. The new generation that we're dealing with, you have the struggle of well, I want to first get married and have kids. Then Jesus can come back. But they do believe he's coming back. We're told that Jesus will rule the world with a rod of iron and he will crush his opponents like you crush pottery. And I will look forward to that day. But I suspect that for Israel, things will be much worse before the church is, is taken out of the world. After the rapture, the planet Earth goes through tremendous upheavals and scarring. There will be massive catastrophes. There will be catastrophes on the order of 9-11 happening two or three times a day. Ecological disasters, Katrina, super hurricanes. Plus there are earthquakes. There's a possibility of meteor hitting the earth. A third of the waters are polluted, turned to blood. By the time you're five, six years into the tribulation period, half of the Earth's population is dead. We think there's violence in wars now. This is going to radically increase. There is this figure that arises called the Antichrist. This figure signs a a peace treaty, a covenant with Israel. That marks this last seven year period of time. So there's a precise countdown, which we refer to as the seven year tribulation. 
And all of this culminates in the armies of the world focusing against Israel, against Jerusalem. And they gather together at a place called in the Bible Har Megiddo, the mountain of Megiddo or Armageddon. Unless you've grown up listening to prophetic sermons, listening to fundamentalist preachers, you can't understand what Armageddon's about. Armageddon, this final war, means this is all going to wrap up and we're finally going to see Jesus and it's going to be over. Who wouldn't want it to be over, the suffering in the world? Even at age nine, I realized that I did not measure up to what God expected of me. I, I can see it right now. I remember leaving the service in which I, I told Christ I was sorry that I was a sinner and that I had done things against him and I asked him to forgive me. I remember walking outside and looking up at the stars outside the front of the church building there and, and, and I just felt clean. I felt different than I went in. I felt like I had dealt with the problems in my life, even at age nine. Christus regna. Christ reigns. Okay, and Christus imperat. Christ, Christ rules. Rules, correct. What does Anno Domini mean? The year In, of our Lord, yeah. In the year of our Lord. Now, history actually divides at the time of Christ's coming throughout the world today. I feel it's important to live a life as a Christian so that were Christ to come, not that I wouldn't go to heaven, or so to speak, or be raptured, but that I would have lived a life that would have been meaningful. Clean off the uh, desktop for you a little bit where you can get a better picture of it. Okay, that gives you a pretty good look at it. But there was a dome here, and I took it out and then I put the temple in, because that's how, at least I believe, it will be someday. It will look about like that. I go to Israel in order to show people the biblical sites. If we're going to understand the past and the future, we have to see Israel. I've been to Israel twice both times with Wayne. We didn't feel a long way from home. We felt that we had come home. We felt that we'd live a long way from Jerusalem. If you're thinking about going to Israel, you must go. You see everything in its context. fascinating to me of all nations on the earth that Israel is a little bitty place that's smaller than Rhode Island is seemingly always in the news. This little strip of land gets more attention almost than any place in the world even though it's almost nothing. And I think there's a reason for that. I think God's God set it up. In May of 1948, a new Jewish state, Israel, was born in a bath of blood. Jewish troops routed Arab forces from the city of Haifa. Conceived in strife and weaned on violence, the Jewish people have a nation of their own. Israel to me is God's timepiece. They've helped us to see that uh, history is moving in a linear direction toward a consummation. Israel's victory was commanded by General Itzhak Rabin. 1967. For the first time in 2,000 years, the Israeli flag flew over Jerusalem. That was momentous in terms of the unfolding of God's purposes.
I got it going, Mike. When the tribulation begins, there will still be many Jews out of the land, but there will be enough Jews in the land to establish a nation. And then there will be a people there who will turn to the Messiah, turn to Jesus and call upon him to come and deliver them and he will return, that's the second coming, and he will save them from destruction and establish his kingdom. And we will get into some more on how we know God still has a plan for Israel when we look at Romans chapter 11 tomorrow night. So let's bow our heads and close in prayer. Father, we thank you that we have such clear, precise revelation in scripture. Father, we thank you for the Jews. We thank you for the fact that they are your chosen people and now through history you have blessed them and it is through them that we have the scriptures and we pray for their salvation, that they would recognize that Jesus is the promised Messiah. Amen. The conflict between Israelis and Palestinians seemed to affect every aspect of daily life in that part of the world. But really, it all goes back to the heart of this bitter conflict, control of the land. On the garbage heap of history, you have the nations that turned against Israel. The Hittites are gone, the Phoenicians are gone, the Assyrians are gone, the Babylonians are gone but the Jews survive. They are an ancient people that can trace their lineage all the way back to Abraham in approximately 2000 BC. Nobody else can do that. So that's, that's the danger, is that God is still saying, they are the apple of my eye. Uh, I have put my blessing upon them, and those who bless them will be blessed, and those who curse them I will judge. When President Bush suddenly sounded tough with Israel, conservative Christians organized an email campaign for 100,000 evangelicals. Us putting that friendly pressure on, I think, helps the president stay on the right track. And the White House does listen when conservative Christians complain. Hezbollah rockets struck back into northern Israel, wounding several. I have said the last year that Israel was entering into the most dangerous period of its entire existence as a nation. God has, a, has enmity against those who, quote, divide my land. God considers this land to be his. You read the Bible, he says, this is my land. There's an area just north of Jerusalem that's a flat plateau, and it's the perfect staging area for attacking Jerusalem, just north of Megiddo, and that's why it's called Armageddon. I think it's an actual battle with horses and, and conventional warfare of something that would have been true in the days of yeah, Christ. Yeah. And uh, because all the modern technology uh, is, is useless yeah. at that point. And some people have questioned prophecy because it talks about these armies and these horses and all this. And they say, well, it can't be because we have modern warfare. But if you understand what's going to happen, then it's very logical that you'll end up back with those kinds of armies once yeah, again. I agree. And there'll be some kind of a blast from Christ or something that will, will do that. And of course, their blood will just leak out all over the place. Some people believe that the destruction of that army will be an atomic blast. Um, it doesn't need to be. It fits the same description, you know, from Hiroshima and, and Nagasaki, but uh, it doesn't have to be an atomic blast because it's going to be selective. It's going to kill the attacking army, but not the Jews, which would then argue against it being just simply an atomic blast. Yeah, this is God's judgment, not yeah, man's. That's right. Uh, He's actions. not using human agency to accomplish this. I think this yeah, will be divine agency. Yeah, it will be something of a miraculous nature. I think that's true. So it's a, it's a fascinating thing, and the cir circumstances in the world today seems to be really setting the stage, especially even what's happening right now in Iraq. The southern part of Iraq was ancient Babylon, and the city of Babylon plays a prominent role in the last days. Yeah. And so the stage appears to be set. South of a place uh, called Mahmudia, which yeah. at the time nobody had heard of, it's now a bit of a hotbed. But, uh... When I turn on the television and I, and I see what's happening either in Iraq or Israel, 
I don't look at what's happening with the hope that it will work out because I see that there are certain things that have to happen for the world to be ready for the return of Christ. We've been told that they're going to experience this distress all the way to the end. I've been to Paris, I've been to London, I've been to you know, Moscow, I've been to New York and Los Angeles, a lot of places in the world. There is something about Jerusalem. This is where Jesus is coming back. Instruments of death here, like this uh, this uh, little pocket knife. Be Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts. Is that it? Paul speaks in Romans chapter six, verse one, that we were buried with Christ in baptism. So the last statements of Christ going up here, uh, going to heaven, is to baptize the nations. And so it demonstrates the importance of baptism. Baptism is not just a good thing to do, it's obedience to Christ. It's the first act formally as a Christian to state where we stand with Christ, that is we believe in Him. Sorry? Thank you, I've practiced several times. <laughs> oh yes, yeah, getting good and deep out here. People can get up here and take pictures also. You can just walk That's too bad. This is a pretty good shot for pictures if you want pictures right here. You can stand up here and get down pretty good. <laughs> okay, uh, people have different ways of doing these things. Sharon is following uh, Christ's commands of baptism. And so I now baptize my sister in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Okay. Yeah, okay. I just have to see. Okay. Yeah, I'll give you a time. Uh, I baptize her, uh, Marisa, right now in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. in the tribulation uh, that, that this will be the final battleground. And there are lots of different thoughts as where that where the final battle happens or, or any of those things. Um, as, a, as a believer in, in our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we'll, have, we'll have the greatest seat of all to watch it. That, that's, that's something that's fantastic to me. Uh, we will not be here, but we'll be able to watch it. You can watch the Both of them. Here they are. Thank you. <laughs> There is an ultimate final battle. Thank you, Rob. It'll be, I think, a lot of fun to watch. You know, not, not fun in the sense of, of uh, knowing that people are dying without having received Christ as their Savior, but, but at the same time, you know, seeing the, the prophecy fulfilled, seeing God's work come out. Uh, Lord, we thank you for all the goodness you bring to us and we uh, ask for your uh, guidance this day. Help us to uh, understand this land and, and this city uh, as you understood it.
A uh, couple things about Herod. Uh, there's no real evidence that Herod ever actually came here. Uh, he made a lot of places. Uh, he had some across the Jordan. <laughs> you have to realize all these places you're looking at once upon a time were covered and nice. It was a nice place to be. It, you weren't out, out in the sun like we're going to be. Okay. This was the last major stronghold against the Roman uh, attempts to subjugate the Jewish people here in the first century that we understand as Americans because Americans have an independent free spirit, particularly like Texans, you know, remember the Alamo. You know, we're not going to be told that we have to use the metric system. You know, if we want to use it, we'll use it. If not, we're not going to. But America is a large enough country, and we, the way we do business, that we can essentially do what we want to in that regard. Sea. Now, anybody staying around the Sea of Galilee much recognizes that this lake is given to storms. And leaving the crowd, they took him with them in the boat, and just as he was, and other boats were with him, and a great windstorm arose. And these fishermen are afraid of the waves, and they bring an indictment against Jesus, don't you care about us? And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, what, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Uh, remember, the Jewish people were still trying to figure out Jesus. And so here he finally walks in the water and, and, and in Mark 4 they said, what kind of man is this? And finally they say, what kind of God is this? When he calms the winds and the storms, and when he walks on water, you better take a second look. And finally, when he rises from the dead, you better take a good hard look. The classical Christian theology is that the Jews are cursed to wander because they didn't accept Jesus. But the uh, Jesus written about in the New Testament is sort of a um, collage. Many, many of the uh, miracles and the details of his life, the kind of things he would put on his uh, curriculum vitae or resume, uh, these are repeat stories. And whether there was in fact a historical Jesus or not, our sources indicate that he was a witch or a sorcerer and uh, a guy who had his eyes on the ladies. and. Um, not the greatest guy in the world, and we don't think he's coming back. With Orthodox Judaism, deep down inside, there's no hope, there's no love, there's no future. In the end, only God can bring salvation to these people. We've established eight outreach projects to the peoples of Israel. And we've been so encouraged to see their response to us as Christians. And we consider the last 2,000 years of history between Christians and Jews has not been so positive. This is one way that we as Christians can make a real positive impact, practically as well as financially. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the second annual Washington-Israel Summit of Christians United for Israel. We have gathered here tonight from every state in the Union to express our solidarity with the state of Israel and the Jewish people of the world. And I need you to go to the phone and call and declare, I will be a friend of Israel. We're going to keep Bible prophecy being fulfilled. And if you'll be one of a thousand, to give a thousand. Now, 
As far as the evangelicals helping, we have a phrase called the golden rule. The one who has the gold is the one who makes the rules. And as one depends for one's budget on somebody, then that somebody tends to gain control over things. And it's a very dangerous thing to accept this money. They believe that Jews will be fulfilled by accepting Jesus. Uh, from a Jewish point of view, the very center of Jewish identity is the Jewish faith. And for Jews to give up their faith would be to cease being Jews. That is the kind of love that is being expressed toward the Jews. We love you and we want you to give up that which is most basic to your identity. It's fascinating to me that fundamentalists are constantly talking about Israel as though they were the best friend of Israel. In fact, they want to convert Jews, and those Jews who don't convert are going to hell. So the people in Israel better be very careful about what kind of attention they give to these fundamentalists. Okay, upstairs. For all the Christians that love Israel, and for all the Israelis who are so grateful to you, Thank you for your friendship. Thank you for your enthusiasm. And thank you for bringing the spirit of God with such colorful and powerful manner as you always do. The state of Israel loves you and thanks you. The Bible clearly predicts that in the center of the Middle East, Israel must exist as a sovereign nation on its original land in the last days. And Jerusalem must be under the sovereign control of Israel. And then in the center of Jerusalem, the Temple Mount has to be returned to Israel in preparation for the rebuilding of the Temple. That has not happened yet, but it's certainly in process. You're not supposed to have any prayer books or Bibles brought into the Temple Mount, okay? Uh, I actually had my Bible taken from here last summer. They went, uh, they took it, and when I came back, another Christian group had left all their Bibles there, and some woman came and scooped up everybody's Bible, including ours, uh -huh. and we didn't get ours back. You can take a notebook. You can take a notebook. Yeah. You can take Palm Pilots that have Bibles on it. <clears throat> yeah and uh, things like that, but the Muslims, they don't like Bibles, so uh, we'll be on the Temple Mount. The old city is very crowded and twisted. It's really like a labyrinth. And you get out of the labyrinth when you get to the Temple Mount and suddenly everything opens. This is huge expanses, just space. the very sensation of space opening. It's a spiritual experience. I do maybe three prayers at the mosque a day. Every Friday we have to pray in the mosque, in Al-Aqsa Mosque, because it is very holy to Muslims. This is the place where uh, our Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, made his night journey from Mecca to Al-Aqsa Mosque. If you do not believe in this, then you are not a real Muslim. This place has been a holy place since the beginning of the world and is in essence the center of the world. And we believe that the rock inside of the Dome of the Rock, which is called in Hebrew the Evan Hashitiyah, which in English means the foundation stone, is the foundation stone of the world. That that is the place from which God spread out the earth. Right now it's in the hands of the Arabs. We want to change that status to uh, return the temple to its glory, rebuild the temple, restore the sacrificial service. That's just the way it works.
These are pictures that are inside the Alaska Mosque. You'll notice also they show from different angles in here. So this is sort of interesting if you want something uh, specifically for the Dome of the Rock. How much are you selling it for? One dollar. Uh, you might want to, you know, you can, uh, you'll, you can dicker with them. <laughs> I believe that uh, there will be a temple built. The Dome of the Rock will somehow be done away with. I have no idea. There's been plenty of earthquakes up there that could solve it. Uh, Saddam could, or not Saddam, but maybe someone from Iran could shoot a missile that gets off target and blow the Dome of the Rock. We kept hoping for that, by the way. I kept hoping one of Saddam's missiles would find its way over to the Dome. I don't know exactly how it's going to be removed, but it is not part of uh, the end times as far as the Bible or Christianity is concerned. I don't think Judaism either. There's no place for that mosque. It has to be removed. For the first time since the past 2,000 years within our generation, we are seeing these preparations for the rebuilding of the temple. They are training the priest. They have the implements in place. There will be a daily offering in the morning, a daily offering in the afternoon, special offerings on the Sabbath and holidays, the Passover sacrifice, all of those will be brought again, and the future temple will stand forever. The problem that you have at the Temple Mount is that possession of the Mount becomes interpreted as possession of the truth. And when people think that they have to possess a place to possess the truth, that turns that spot into the blasting cap of religious conflict. Some who believe that if they want to start a temple again, they're even creating uh, temple vessels. Uh, they're trying to get ready for the building of the temple. But remember Jesus when he said, not one rock shall stand upon another. See what beautiful edifices that are on top of this temple here. See all these wonderful buildings around. There is not a single stone of the building left. The buildings are all gone. Jesus didn't say, and after they finish the buildings, I'll take in the retaining wall. Yes. Yeah. Not too late. Yeah. I'm sorry. When we talk, it's okay. sensitive. I'm sorry. Not too late. Yeah. No, get. No, I mean it. We. Uh, the very. That's um, when we talk about either Jewish temple or a Christ in the temple and so on. Things are quite sensitive here. So okay. we always try not to. You no, know, we don't want to get into arguments or any kind of clashes here. Oh, that's fine. Thank you. Uh, I'm used to talking loud to be sure project enough you can hear me. So I apologize. Uh, but anyway, the point of it is, uh, not one stone would be left on top of another refers to the buildings that the disciples were talking about, not the retaining walls around the building. I mean, can I ask you to take another picture, please? Americans have been making pilgrimages to the Middle East for hundreds of years. It's part of uh, being biblically literate to go there and walk the same ground that Jesus walked on. It's a very powerful idea. When you combine that with the idea of triumphalism, the idea that my religion is the only true religion and my God is the only true God, and you walk with that attitude to the Temple Mount, it is designed to create a confrontation. They don't want a peace process. They want the Muslims to be evicted by the Jews, the Jews to rebuild the Temple of Solomon, and then Christ to return and trump everybody. Family, so let's just uh, have a real quick word of prayer before anybody comes up. We can have an international incident, okay? Yes. Lord, we do thank you for uh, your grace, your goodness, that you care about the uh, suffering we go through. We continue to pray for Kendall. We pray for your healing hand on him, wisdom for the doctors, for his family, that they might keep their focus on you and be in solid testimony. Things are coming to a head here. Some people are studying where to put an A-bomb in such a way that it will have repercussions, earthquakes, enough to flatten uh, the whole area. Even a symbolic act there can ignite violence, particularly at a time when the tension between the Islamic world and the West is so great. 
uh, some young worshippers began to throw stones at Israeli security forces. The Israelis responded with stun grenades, with, uh, with tear gas, and pandemonium ensued as Israeli forces basically took over the entire uh, compound of the Aqsa Mosque. And uh, that standoff went on. Iran, 12 Shiites are for me much more dangerous than those uh, Texan uh, evangelicals. Huh? But together, they may lock into something really destructive. During the tribulation period, Jerusalem will become a place of horror for the nations. I mean, it will be a horrible time uh, for the Jews because the, the, the anvil on which the, the human race seems to be crushed is Israel. Scripture is saying Israel will be forced into signing a seven-year peace treaty with their Arab neighbors. And the false messiah, we call the Antichrist, will institute this peace treaty. And he will move into the temple, which he will have built, and declare himself God. And then the Jewish people will, will realize that he's not the promised messiah. And then things, then things get really bad as I think most Christians would, would understand to be the case. And that would lead to uh, Armageddon. God's timetable, only God knows. But I think ultimately we're moving in that direction where there is gonna be a confrontation between the West and, and Islam for sure. Let's be frank, Islam's goal is not just the Middle East, it's the whole world. Islam is a world-dominating religion, and they have a duty under the religious view to essentially take over the world for Allah. So well, I don't think they can ever be happy that Israel is a nation of Jewish people that are not subservient to Islam. In the 1970s, the evil ones were Red China or the communist bloc Russia. But of course now with the fall of Russia and the end of the Cold War, then you look for another antichrist du jour to label as the evildoers, and this has now shifted to demonizing the Muslim world. Apocalyptic books like Revelation or Daniel were never meant to be scripts for those in power, and that's when danger arises. That's when the book becomes kind of even a self-fulfilling prophecy of violence and destruction. The American Christian right have what I would call an apocalyptic foreign policy. And if the people who are most making their voice heard in Capitol Hill or at the White House are people who think that any uh, peace plan is a, is a plot of the Antichrist, uh, that's going to get in the way of pursuing peace. The only place you really have this statement of Armageddon is over here in Revelation. Let me just give you the passage. And since we're standing here at the place, behold, I am coming like a thief, Jesus says, and they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. And that's the only mention here. But uh, years ago, I used to be a police officer and uh, for about four years a deputy sheriff and went on many raids. We'd go and have some fun, you know, breaking in places. And, and uh, but we would always meet as a police group, there may be 15 different police cars. We'd always meet at a staging area. There we'd check our guns, check everything we have, make sure the warrant is okay. And then we would all 
leave and converge. And I think that's what this is. I think this is a staging area where the armies come together, get everything organized. You want to make sure everybody understands the game plan. And then you head south, I believe, to Jerusalem. And I think that's where the battle occurs, not here at Armageddon. Uh, we know what happens when they get south. Uh, they wish they'd stayed north. will come back with a sword on his side, and he will come back as the ultimate judge of the world. We're gonna be behind him with, I believe, swords in our hands, and we're gonna, we're gonna be his army. And this battle, the blood from this battle will be as high as a horse's bridle. It's, it's just something mankind has never witnessed before. Combine all world wars you want with all the other wars into one. Iwo Jima, think yeah. of Hiroshima. Think of Gettysburg. Uh, everywhere on the face of the planet all at once. You know, think of just the mayhem and the bloodshed and the anger and the, the hurtling screams. God will then set up uh, his, his kingdom back on earth, you know, free of evil. We started this little church not realizing we were starting a church back in 1982 with uh, four couples, just eight people meeting in our house. The scripture speaks of Israel being a, a heavy stone in the end times, and, and all who would try to lift that stone or move that stone will be hurt. Separation of church and state is such a myth. We encourage our people to vote. We even register people to vote. Christian fundamentalists believe that this country is responsible to Christianize the world, therefore they have to Christianize America first. Build your hopes on it, build your future on it, build your children on it. This is the solid rock. It's not just that God thinks his order is the best way, he thinks it's the only way. To allow a Christian cross to remain in the middle of a national preserve. Bring back the Messiah in our generation. The world is they are more powerful than ABC, CBS, and NBC together. They reach 200 million people around the world every week in 77 languages on 40,000 radio stations just here in America. You could get raptured out of this building before I get through finished preaching. We are that close to the coming of the Son of Man. They are not going away. They are so firmly entrenched on the executive, legislative, and judicial branches in Washington, D.C., and in every state capital, and in the school boards of this country, they are everywhere. And as the prophets foretold, God will come to take his people home. No one knows the day or the hour. Without any warning, all infants, children, and many people mysteriously disappear. Terror and confusion reign the world over. For those left behind, the apocalypse has just begun. The Left Behind novels begin after the good Christians who have been good all along have been raptured. 
Well, what happens to everybody else? Either you convert to our form of Christianity, or you are going to be hunted down by the agents of the Antichrist. And so it's either convert or die. Praise the Lord. Armageddon theology, rapture theology, this interest in war and the violence of the end times seems to have an almost addictive power in our culture. I think we can see that in the Left Behind novels, how each one is almost sort of more graphic and violent than the previous one, and people like that. That's what sells. Seven friends to go. A kind of voyeuristic um, wanting to see the suffering and death of others and this idea that I'm going to be one of the saved, but my neighbor is not. When you turn your heart and your life over to Christ, when you accept Christ as a savior, it changes your heart, it changes your life. The most important thing in my life is Jesus Christ. Christians in America have always been politically active, but Jimmy Carter was the first president to announce that he had been born again. And evangelicals were absolutely celebratory that here was a person who stood up for God, stood up for Jesus. So a strange thing happened. A lot of political organizers on the right saw this and said, if Democrats can attract these people, so can we, and we can do a better job. This is the country God has raised up for the purpose of world evangelization. And they concocted the idea of a moral majority. Moral majority is active in 47 states. Leaders claim they've already gotten 2 million born-again Christians registered to vote, and they hope to get 3 million more by election day. Moral majority also influenced the Republican platform, one that will enable conservative pastors to rally their flocks for Ronald Reagan. Mr. President, I'd like to pick up this Armageddon theme. You've been quoted as saying that you do believe deep down that we are heading for some kind of Biblical Armageddon. Your Pentagon and your Secretary of Defense have plans for the United States to fight and prevail in a nuclear war. Do you feel that we are now heading perhaps for some kind of nuclear Armageddon? The prophecies down through the years, the biblical prophecies of what would portend the coming of Armageddon and so forth, and the fact that a number of uh, theologians for the last decade or more have believed that um, this was true, that the prophecies are coming together that portend that. But no one knows whether Armageddon, those prophecies mean that Armageddon is a thousand years away uh, or day after tomorrow. Pre-trib refers to the unique perspective that Christ will be coming uh, for his church, the bride, his bride, uh, prior to a period of tribulation. And there are people here that have radio programs, television programs, you know, national exposure, uh, writing books, things of that sort that reach, I'm sure, millions. Germany was a literal fulfillment, one in recent history where we can see this prophecy was coming absolutely true. There is another prophecy just across a couple of pages, Deuteronomy chapter 30. This is a terrific teaching tool of Bible prophecy. Right here is an example. You have Satan coming down. Um, there's the Antichrist. And it's all against a backdrop of uh, history. Of course, this is future history. Since God knows the future, he knows it perfectly. And that's what we find here. This book is going to focus on how the voice of God will shake the earth at the resurrection and the rapture. And it's, it's something that a lot of the, the traditional prophetic models aren't uh, paying a lot of attention to as far as a global catastrophe at that time. 
And the war in Iraq is particularly disturbing because the prophetic implications, well, actually it's a good thing for, for Christians, but the prophetic signs are, they're increasing just like the birth contractions of a woman uh, before she gives birth. Uh, they get faster and faster as, as the time goes. Our next speaker is Wayne House. And I met Wayne uh, a number of years ago, and he's written at least 30 books, right, Wayne? 34. Just to uh, share something with you on a tour that I uh, did with some of Robbie and his people this past uh, summer. Uh, if you notice, we did away with that big uh, gold-looking thing. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> So, <laughs> just who is God? Did God even know prior to September the 11th that it would actually bring forth terrorism? Having let the planes hit the buildings, did he then recognize that he should have done something else? <laughs> And we try to do better next time. <laughs> the Bible presents a God who is incapable of failing. Why does he know that something will occur? Because he is in charge of it. I believe that there's been a major shift in the last 15 to 20 years from basically a culture that thinks about the Bible in a more rational way to more of a mysticism. And that mysticism is postmodernism. That has led to a decline in people interpreting the Bible literally. What is postmodernism? Postmodernism is a worldview vying for the hearts and minds of the whole world. Postmodernists have their theological underpinnings in atheism. Everything's up for grabs. It is. Everything I say, if Derrida were here today, he would agree, and then he would say, or what? Anyone know his famous statement? Or vice versa. <laughs> Thus, postmodern literary criticism claims that words never describe, get this, the objective world. Wow. And this is heavy. On one level, we can agree that the statement, the train is coming, may convey a multitude of interpretations to different people. But we contend that if people fail to get off the tracks, the result of their interpretation could prove fatal. You talk about foolishness. Look at the results of applying deconstruction to law revealed in the 1973 Roe v. Wade case. The Supreme Court justices chose to look at the Constitution as a living document. That is open to many interpretations. One consequence of that interpretation is that since 1973, over 40 million unborn children have been murdered at the request of their own mothers. Postmodernists are correct about one thing, interpretation is important. Confucius is quoted as saying, when words lose their meaning, people lose their freedom. However, it's worse than that. In reality, when words lose their meaning, people not only lose their freedom, they lose their lives. America is already engaged in the Third World War, and we simply do not know it. The battle for the survival of America and Western civilization is engaged. Why were we attacked on 9-11? This is a statement that people keep asking. Why do they hate us? They don't hate us because of our support for Israel. Only someone dumb enough to believe the New York Times would believe that. They hate us because it's their religious duty to hate us. They hate us because radical Islam is a doctrine of death. It is their desire, their hope, their ambition, their highest honor to die as a martyr killing Christians and Jews. Islamophasius called Jews apes and pigs. They called Christians, quote, those who incur Allah's wrath. 
All must be killed if they do not convert. If you think that they can be negotiated with or reasoned with, you're simply mistaken. Now America is trying to gut Israel to appease Islamofascism, saying give them Judea and give them Samaria, give them part of Jerusalem. I say never, Amen. never. Because the integrity of God rest with Israel and his ability to keep the city of Jerusalem as his now and forever. Continue with the validation that the world is at war. Consider that America, England, France, Israel have been attacked. Spain is at war with radical Islam. France is at war with radical Islam. Last spring, the world watched on global television as radical Islamic youth set Paris on fire night after night, hour after hour, chanting death to the Jews, death to the Jews. When you throw in the Islamic attacks in Pakistan, Afghanistan, Yemen, Kuwait, Philippines, Egypt, Turkey, Bangladesh, and Thailand, World War III has started. in major cities of America right now waiting to respond to the commands that they have. They intend to conquer America. They intend to crush Western civilization. There is a war between Islamic fascism and freedom. There is a war between the culture of death and those life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is a war we must win. The Bible says that you, ladies and gentlemen, are the light of the world. May God anoint each of you, and there can be a spiritual awakening in this country that Christ will be seen as the answer, for there is no other name given among men whereby we might be saved. Pastor John Hagee advocated a strike on Iran on the part of the United States. This is really dangerous in terms of geopolitics to think that somehow United States foreign policy is prescribed in the Bible. God doesn't require World War III as part of the prophetic plan. I've written the books for the evangelicals. I have pastored an evangelical church. I am an evangelical. But I'm seeing so many of my fellow evangelicals who are being betrayed by leaders who are in a kind of fit of fundamentalism. <laughs> Go ask John where a can opener is. Oh, gosh, she's a child. I know, when you made me cut off a finger. John, put, put your chair yeah, towards the Ashley. Okay, you know, let's see, that's going to come down to you. Can you stretch that out for me a little bit? Can you pull on that? Okay, like this. He just wants me this. I know for the Bible that. Okay. Yeah. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones. Him belong, they are weak, but he is strong.
First of all, Christ is going to trash the planet during the tribulation. He's going to destroy the planet, but he's going to clean it up for what's called the millennium, the thousand year reign of Christ. Won't even have to use the EPA or anything. And he is going to bring in a improved environment supernaturally. The present heavens and earth are completely destroyed and a new heavens and new earth are created. With a new Jerusalem, the only city that has a permanent future. And the Jewish people as a totality, having gone through a tribulation period, I think they will, as a group, as a whole, whole, whole nation, will embrace Yeshua as their Messiah. It, it, it's almost as if the world is going to return to its pristine state. There will be no evil, so there will be no sin, there will be no death. You may find nature in a perpetual uh, flowering stage, you know, you may not have a fall. I, I, who knows? But the lion sits down with the lamb and doesn't eat each other, and children can play with vipers. When Jesus sets up his kingdom that lasts for a thousand years, I want to be invited to be one of the ministers in his government, whether it's the dog catcher in some town, the, you know, the chief of agriculture of this area. So I look forward to it. I'm excited about the rapture of the church. I wish it would happen before things get real bad. We are heartbroken to see what is occurring in Iraq, throughout the Middle East, with all of these, uh, this tragedy going on. At the same time, it is sweet in the sense that it is not history running out of control. God is in control of history, and the end of it has a beautiful ending.